Let's get ready to rumble! All right, let's go because you know what I came in to do. I don't get paid for overtime. I'm here to fight. Apologies to all the fans. New day is May the 25th. He's just delayed the beating. I was going to say the fight started to look jinxed, but that would mean that I believed Josh Taylor really wanted the fight and circumstances were beyond his control. And that may well be the case, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure because we're talking February 2022, the first fight. The rematch scheduled for 2023. Taylor was said to have a foot injury. Cancelled that. Headed off in another direction later and lost his remaining strap, I believe it was, to Tiafima Lopez. Finally, it looked like we nailed down the rematch for the 27th of April. And today, what to my knowledge, a mystery injury takes Josh Taylor out of the fight. They're saying the 25th of May is the rescheduled date. Not really holding my breath though. We've passed two years and this fight hasn't happened. If it doesn't happen May, I would urge Eddie Hearn to try and convince Jack Catterall. Get on with your career, man. It doesn't seem healthy to his career to chase one fight for so long. It really doesn't. I've never believed that Josh Taylor really wanted the fight. I think this last cancellation that he signed a contract for was just a case that he had nowhere else to go. Top rank, they ain't got no work for him. They let him go across the street to match him because they got no work for him. I don't like that phrase getting cashed out, but if anyone uses it in the comment section, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue with you. If the injuries are legit, the way his body is breaking down, the future doesn't bode well for Josh Taylor. If it's legit injuries, this kept him out of the fight a couple of times. Jack Catterall's got to start thinking about this pragmatically. When do you move on? I got this this morning, an apology from Josh Taylor. He said he had an eye procedure in February and went to have a checkup and they said the recovery had slowed up, hence the postponement. Well, we'll have to take his word for it. We'll have to take his word. A lot of people think that he was trying to stall for time, get more time to prepare. A lot of people are probably sceptical that he'll even make it to the ring or if this fight will actually happen. If you could make one fight, which is a rematch, including Dubois, I know that you won that fight, uh, what's the one rematch that you'd like to make? Um, the Parker rematch, there's the Dubois rematch, even, I don't think, I, I don't think, I, I'm not, do I want to fight Zag? I don't know if about, I'll fight Zag again, he's got like a bit of an awkward style for me. Uh, did Joe Joyce just say, I don't fancy rematching Zhang. He's just got an awkward style for me. I'm thinking what would happen if Anthony Joshua ever uttered such words. How the media would react. How it would probably trend. Maybe for a couple of months that he was mentally damaged. Can't face the Zhang demons. A broken man on his way out. But that's what Joe Joyce just said. And look, I don't want to make any rash assumptions after hearing him say that, but it does make me question how mentally strong he is. Now look, maybe in a year or so he might feel different about it, but I would hope if someone proposed that fight to him, let's say he beats Cash Alley on Saturday, and someone proposes that he fights Zhang next in Saudi Arabia or in London, wherever, that he takes the fight. But it looks like the message has been beaten into his head. He can't f*** with Zhang. Even though Vianney's just coming off an L. It is someone who Joyce knocked out not too long ago. Well, they say styles make fights. And they're right. I don't know if this is the footage that Joe Joyce was talking about, but this was a year ago where Martin Bacoli, sparring Joe, is definitely getting the better of the exchange and he knocks Joyce's headgear off his head. Joe's not hurt, but he's getting lit up. Now, if Joyce today was complaining that Bacoli released sparring footage, like I said, I don't know if they're referring to this clip here. And Joyce wasn't happy with Bacoli. He said he seemed like a decent guy. But for him to do that, it's kind of messed up. And it looks like Sam Jones and <laughs> Joyce have plotted revenge. And they released this footage of Martin Bacoli on his knees from what Joe said was a body attack. And Bacoli bailed out. Now, it serves Bacoli right. Because you know, he spilt the beans on Joyce, on Yusek, and a few others. Dubois. But I don't trust this footage from Joe Joyce. 
because they haven't shown none of their sparring. They've just shoved Martin on his knees. Now, for all I know, it could be a low blow. Foul tactics. Let's put Martin on his knees here. They've definitely edited this to make Joyce look like he did legit damage. But how do we know? What happened before Martin was put on his knees? Maybe we'll never know, but the Martin Bacoli haters, they'll be having a good laugh at this. They'll be having a good laugh. And maybe these tactics for sparring snitching may work for him and Billy Nelson and they'll land a big fight. It's a little tacky though. I'd have to say that. But he does look in bad shape there. Crawling on the ground, he looks in bad shape. And no one's assisting him. Maybe everyone just hates Martin now. Michael Benson reports that Mauricio Sullivan still wants to go ahead and trial this new judging system when Alexander Utsek takes on Tyson Fury. He wants six judges to score the fight. He's made an emergency petition to the rest of the sanctioning bodies and all the parties involved. Chris Andre, he responds to the post and says, no, you do not trial in the most significant fight. Chris says heavyweight fight. I'll go one further and say the most significant fight, period, in the 21st century. You trial it on small hall shows for a couple of years and see how it works. Now, Chris is spot on the money. If you trial something, because trials on all different products, are attempted through all different industries and a lot of them fail. Why this fight here? Why not concentrate on getting three competent judges rather than six judges? Make the criteria on picking the judges a lot more stringent than you have been. It's like throwing money at a problem that you can work out with common sense. And it seems to me that like the WBC whether it's justifying Francis Ngannou's ranking or actually putting up a belt for the Ngannou Fury fight and this crackpot idea are just attention seekers in all truth. But I'm not telling you nothing you didn't know. The odd pairing of Maxa Hughes and Lou DiBella. I didn't realise Lou was promoting him. Not odd pair, but unlikely pairing. Maxi, a Yorkshireman from the UK, he takes on William Zabela in Las Vegas on Saturday. Did Maxi say that the... WBA and IBF called this a double eliminator at 135. Don't think I've heard the likes of. Now, Maxi is here despite losing to George Cambosos last time out. It was a controversial enough decision that he's been pitched in another big fight, which will lead on to world title shots if he's successful. Maxi, 34 years of age, 26, 6 and 2, only 5 inside the distance. William Sabeda, He's 27 years of age. He's got five times the amount of stoppages, 25. And he's currently 29 and 0, oh, a Mexican. Relentless volume puncher. Maxi, he's a southpaw counter-punching boxer. I'm not going to call him Slapsy Maxi, but you know, five inside the distance in 34 fights. Tells you a story. I actually think Maxi can take some rounds from Zabeda boxing. But it's when he's got to match offense with Zabeda where I think he's going to come off second. I think he can go the distance and lose a points decision. Maxi is a late bloomer who looked destined to be European and British level. It would be a huge achievement if he can beat William Sabeda tomorrow. A huge achievement in Las Vegas. But his lack of firepower is ultimately, you know, why I'm picking Zabeda. Not that Zabeda is a one-punch knockout artist. He's more an accumulation puncher. And the more he's stepped up, the knockouts have looked less likely to happen. Still a good fight though. Maxi's got to go out there positive, keeps a beta off balance, score, score points, score points for as long as he can. And when he's forced to trade, bite down on that dumb shield and give it all you got, son. Give it all you got. I'm picking a beta. Points win, possible late stoppage. Hold on. Where is he? Where is he? Where's, where's Isaac Chamberlain? We can't find him anywhere. No, no, no. Shh. Whatever you do, don't mention Chev Clark. Just pretend he doesn't exist. Because they know. One, because they don't want to. They're scared to go to purse bids. Two, because he's a beast. And he'd absolutely destroy Isaac Chamberlain, who I like, and he'll destroy Vidal Riley. And I believe he beats Billum Smith. And I believe he beats Richard Breakport now. The only. The jury is out. 
Eddie, the jury is out whether Chef Clark can destroy Isaac Chamberlain, who's never been stopped before. The likes of Billiam Smith. I believe Chev has got the skill to beat Billiam Smith. It all depends, like, can he take Billiam's best shot? Can he outgrit him, let's say, championship rounds in the trenches? And can Chef Clark beat Richard Riakpo, who's a huge puncher? I don't know about that. That's Eddie doing his salesman pitch as Chev's promoter. But we're back here again. Matt from Fighter, Boxer Fighter, Purse Bid. We're back here again. April the 10th are the purse bids for Chevron Clark, the mandatory challenger for Isaac Chamberlain's British title at Cruiserweight. Now, I don't have to remind you, Boxer's record, appalling record in handling purse bids between Boxer and match from fighters. Is anything going to change here? How does Ben Shalom expect to get his fighters in the mix? In Saudi Arabia and you won't even take on one of the main promoters over there you won't even take on one of his fighters how are you going to challenge you're not being competitive I don't look forward to this section of the video when I've got to talk about match from boxer purse bid I don't look forward to it at all it's becoming tedious Clark Wardley Opatar Riakpour Smith Azim Beatrice Ferreira Caroline Dubois and boxing fans are sick of it at this point. Super middleweight for me suits Canelo. Um, I think I'd have done him at super middle. I don't think he's big enough, but I think I'd have beat everyone, to be honest. That's what I did when I went in that ring. I went in with that mindset. Um, I think Charlo's going to struggle. How Stylistically, then, talk, talk me through how... Because you obviously come forward, all action. Is that what you do? You try to back him up? Well, you saw my fight against Arthur Abraham, and it wasn't come forward. Or actually, I, I boxed. No, it was the, slicker. Yeah, I yeah, boxed yeah. the move and, and stay, did what I had to do to, and that's how I would have approached Canelo. John Ryder, excellent fighter, never duck no smoke. But let me say this: the John Ryder that took Canelo to full twelve and had Canelo wearing shades after would be lucky to see the final bell against Carl Froch or George Groves. Britain have done very well in the super middleweight division. Very well. From the 90s up until Callum Smith and Billy Joe Saunders, they did well. But John Ryder, Callum Smith, Billy Joe Saunders are not on the level of Froch, Calzaghi, Eubank, British 168-pound world champions from a different era. And Canelo hasn't faced none of them guys I mentioned, the earlier British super middleweight champions. I've done a fantasy matchup at 168, Canelo versus Froch. For some reason, I get a much bigger sample size on YouTube, Google than I do on Twitter. Probably because I got more subs on YouTube. 432 people voted. And it's 76% Canelo, 24% Carl Froch in who they think would win. And I was expecting a more evenly spread poll. I really was. I think this poll probably shocked me more than any other poll. But yeah, weighing up the... Recent 168 pound British middleweight world champions, Callum Smith, Billy Joe Saunders, Rocky Fielding, interim champion, just like um, John Ryder was. They're, they're not on the same level as Calzaghi, Froch, Eubank. Let's not forget George Groves. George Groves would be in that box as well. And Nigel Benn. Although Nigel made his name at 160 more than 168. Still be a very dangerous fight for Canelo though. Nigel Benn and George Groves are awesome punchers. I nearly forgot James DeGale. If I had put this out and forgot James DeGale, I would have took the video down and did it again. How would he shape up against Canelo? Froch would have made use of that reach, trust me. McCracken and Froch would have strategized to box and fight Canelo. Froch had a great gas tank. He could be put on the floor, yes, but he always got back up and won. I wasn't scared to take punches. A lot more tougher than Callum Smith, I believe. I'm still undecided who I'd pick out of Froch and Canelo, I'll be honest with you. Cobra got one of the best modern-day British boxing resumes. Kessler twice, Arthur Abraham, Darrell, Andre Ward, Groves twice, Glenn Johnson, Pascal. Arguably a better super middleweight resume than Canelo. I'd actually be tempted to pick Froch over him. But I was stunned by the wide margin Canelo was in front, perhaps because Froch hasn't fought for 10 years. Absences made people forget what he was capable of doing. Would that poll be the same if they took it just after he knocked out George Groves, his last fight? Brian Bulmack, 
inside info that the Eubank Jr. fight is no good. Apparently, Bo Mack got in contact with the boxing voice and told him all this news about Eubank versus Crawford is nonsense. It's fake news. And that's why when the story came up, I said, I'm not going to give this too much time because Eubank ain't a promoter. And he doesn't have the authority to call a fight like that. Crawford would announce that. Yeah, it's fake news, as I thought. What's in it for Crawford? Eubank don't have a strap. Why don't Eubank go beat Johnny Beck at 160 and they'd have more leverage to call some of these fights? He withdrew from his mandatory against Johnny Beck. Why? That's why I can't take Chris serious no more. I used to support, but I can't take him serious right now the way he's moving. It's fake news. But who put it out there? It's not like one of the sources got it incorrect. It was Eubank who posted this on Twitter that he was going to fight Terence Crawford. So what's going on with Chris right now? Where did he get the news from? Did he just make it up? Eddie offered Crawford a very good alternative when he heard that he could be possibly fighting Eubank. He laughed that off and said, why don't you take on Israel Madrimov who just won the WBA 154 pound belt, the full title that Jamel was stripped of he gets the chance to become a four-weight world champion. Go across to the zone and take that fight. They'll pay you well. Surely that's a winnable fight for Terence. Not an easy fight, but a winnable fight. That's way better than the Eubank fight. Joe Joyce weighed in 286 pounds for the Cash Alley fight. Five pounds heavier than what he weighed in for the knockout defeat against Zhang last year. He's 38 years of age. Where is his career at? Like, they were saying he was too light for the first Zhang fight. So he weighed in 281. Got beaten worse than he did in the first fight. And he was coming back at 286. What's the science behind that? We'll see. We'll see what Joyce can do. Cash Alley went eyeball to eyeball with Joyce. Cash looked a bit shook. I'm not going to front. He looked a bit shook. Joyce also done an interview on Seconds Out yesterday. And I wasn't going to mention it, but someone mentioned it on Twitter. So I know I'm not crazy. And he was stuttering a lot, and he was forgetting what he was saying on maybe one too many occasion. I'll say no more. Uh.